Bluff City Media presents The Anthony Sane Show on YouTube at Bluff City Media. Stepping up to the microphone is your host, Anthony Sane. Acknowledge me. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to The Anthony Sane Show. This, of course, is your host, Anthony Sane, here live from the Bluff City Media Studios. My boy, Kenny Stubblefield, across the glass. What's going on with you, Kenny? My brother, how are you, man? Man, I'm good, man. It's going to be a good show today. Uh, kind of a bittersweet moment. My man Clayton Carrier, a good friend of mine, man, is about to slide up out of Memphis. Uh, this is actually his final day here. But with that being said, he's going to slide through here and um, do a segment with us. He's going to do sit down with saying he'll be my special guest. We'll talk about his journey here in the city of Memphis. Uh, some of the things that he thought uh, makes him who he is as a journalist. Uh, well, I want to talk about him about things like that. And just, of course, some of the you know local news. I also have an interesting question. man. I want to find out who are the, his top four like his his Mount Rushmore, so to speak, of a Memphis uh, 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 people, like you know your your athletes, athletes, athletes yeah. players, coaches, yeah. executives, whatever. I want to see who he's got as his top four. I'm sure I'm going to get some good answers from him um, when we do the sit down with Saint. <clears throat> but first, uh, Kenny Stubblefield, since the last time we talked, I kind of had my show planned out on kind of Sunday night, Monday. I was like, well, okay, this is going on. Got FIBA to talk about, you know what I mean? I got uh, all kind of stuff, man. I had the Hall of Fame, Basketball Hall of Fame, James Harden, you know, saying crazy shit in the middle of the night, you know, about <laughs> <laughs> about uh, Dara Morey, et cetera. Let me repeat myself. Yeah, so I was like, I had to sit. I was going to I was gonna open the show today talking about FIBA basketball, Jaron Jackson Jr., Santi Aldama, those type of things. And then this happened, man. A story that is not only local news. Uh, I, I typically like the show to be local, talk about a lot of local stuff, especially when we open the show. Um, but the biggest local news, which is also a huge national news story, of course, is the situation between Michael Orr and the Tui family. Uh, Sean and Leanne Tui, uh, of course, are Memphians who um, I don't really know what they did. <laughs> I think about it. They yep. took uh, Michael Orr in, uh, into custody. He was living with them. Um you, of course, know Michael Orr from the movie Blindside, the Tui family from the movie Blindside, a movie I've never seen. Let me put that Oh, you haven't seen I've it? I've never seen the movie. I never had a desire to. Yeah, I got you. Like, I, I kind of knew where this movie was going, and I didn't want to watch it. Um, I knew it was a big deal. A lot of people talked about it. But just something about the whole situation just wouldn't give me peace. I just wasn't a fan of wanting to watch the movie. Um, had my reasons, you know, and I'll talk about those as we go on. But um, Michael Orr basically came out and said that the, the movie was a false representation of what really was going on. He said, he said that years ago, too, right? Yeah, like, I think he did. That's been a while since he and, said that. Um, and he said that he was never adopted by the Tui family. They had a, uh, what's the thing called? A conservator conservatorship. It's a weird word. It's hard for me to say. My country accent won't let mm -hmm. me say it. And you probably, heard this, yeah. you, you probably heard this term used before with one Britney Spears, uh, <laughs> Kenny Stubblefield. This is, that was the first time I had ever heard this before. And um, it's basically an, an agreement that is made to, it's a little bit, I heard it was a little bit different than getting uh, guardianship. And it gives you uh, legal control over the person, their name, image, and likeness, that you make decisions for them, all those type of things. And it's typically given to someone who is handicapped or disabled or has something going on that's preventing them from making lo logical decisions on their own. And it's usually granted to family. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael Orr, uh, I think I read that they were not able to adopt him because he was already 18 years old. So this is the only way that they could go about having that control over him. And you ask yourself, why did the Tui family feel the need to have control over Michael Orr, who was a fully functioning, high, high level high school football prospect uh, who could probably go to whatever school he wanted to go to? Um, and let's, I'm gonna also going to do this. I'm going to eliminate anything that the movie told you because I'm, I'm going to deal with the fact or at least – not nonsense, you know what I mean? And we know for a fact that Michael Orr was a high school football player before meeting the Tui family. Right. He was a good player before meeting the, uh, the Tui family. Uh, spent years at Melrose. He was at Briarcrest already playing football when they met him. They didn't meet him homeless on the street. or what. I've never seen the movie, so you have to tell me. Walking in rain. Right, he wasn't like out looking bummy, you know what I mean, when they met this kid. But Michael Orr's story probably looked like a lot of kids' story in the city of Memphis. Um, we, me and you, Kenny, both have worked in the inner city 
uh, with young people. I talked about this from my very first episode. We've seen a lot of Michael Orr type situations, kids who don't have the most stable home situation, super talented in the sport, don't have the best support system, uh, may need a little direction, things like that. But this kid was a bride, Chris, man. <laughs> like, and I, I understand people saying that the, the two-week family – if it wasn't for them, this no, there are not many kids that are high level athletes coming out of Briarcrest that don't have someone who's going to direct them to where he needs to go or, or get him on the path where he needs to get. He wasn't some kid playing street football that the two we. I don't know what the story, what the movie tells, but I know it was some nonsense. It well, wasn't the truth. The movie tells us that the little kid that who's now a grown man, mm -hmm. SJ Tui, taught Michael Orr how to play football using <laughs> uh, vegetable cans on a kitchen table. Yeah, this kid was a high level. High, high-level uh, player when they met him. So that's the thing. Um, also saw that in the conservatorship that it takes a lot to get those uh, approved. There was a lady on Instagram who's got a law background. She was saying she didn't understand how it was approved in the beginning, especially one that lasts this long where he's still under it. You typically don't see that. She was wondering what how that was even able to uh, happen in the first place. Uh, Michael Orr is saying that he hasn't made a dollar off of the movie, he hasn't made anything. It's the Tui family has grossed. All of those funds, um, something that a lot of people are screaming out is that the Tui family is, they're millionaires. They got plenty of money. They were owners of Taco Bell, uh, multimillionaires, that so they didn't need this money. Uh, I don't know many rich people who turn down money. Kenny It seems like the rich get richer, and the rich people like having additional flows of income, you know what I mean, that can keep them solidified as rich. So I don't want to hear it because – yeah, they made, they're making their money, but they weren't selling books and making movies. And can I say something about that Go real ahead. quick? Mm -hmm. I don't think the money amount matters. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Who cares? Matters. Yeah. So if, if, Who if, cares if you made 70000 mm -hmm. Who cares if you made $4 million? But you made $70 million. Who cares? Yeah. Take care of the dude if the story was about him. This is his story. Right. Mm -hmm. He's the hero of his story. Not y'all. Not y'all. Thank you, man. I'm so glad you said that because here, here's the thing, man. Maybe, I, maybe I'm oversimplifying this. Maybe I'm just being goofy, whatever y'all want to say. My decision about this story was made back when I heard about this story, 2005, six, whatever year it was. Right. I didn't make my decision on this story in 2023 because my thing was back then, this kid was targeted. Can you still feel like, like why are we acting like they, they found some kid who was, who was in a bad situation and they wanted to help him out and they did this out of their honest heart. Oh, I want to see this kid make it in life. No, you targeted this huge Six foot whatever black kid, and you said this kid is going to be a millionaire one day. Let me get him to my alma mater. Let me get him to the NFL, and let me get let me. Uh, oh man, Sean Tui admitted that yesterday. In 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 a response, mm -hmm. he said the reason why they did this, and and you've said the word correctly now mm -hmm. a few times. I'm I'm going to struggle, but that conservatorship. Yep. The reason why they did that conservatorship is to, I think. Is to appease the NCAA mm -hmm. regarding. His admitted his being admitted mm -hmm. to Ole Miss to play football because he he didn't have to go to Ole Miss he didn't have to go to Ole Miss the, <laughs> but the way that it was presented yesterday was he really wanted to go to Ole Miss and so for the NCAA to get off his back we did it this way because of the relationship that we had developed with right. him and it just so happened that his coach his high school coach Hugh Freeze also came to Ole Miss in that deal. Which is, you know, get out of my face. I guess, I guess that's really what he really wanted to. This kid was clearly targeted, and this is what I'm gonna say, Kenny. This is what I'm sure people are gonna get mad, but I've made these type of points before. If Michael Orr was not a football player, if he was not this elite level, you know, four or five star uh, potential football player, he would be the face of fear to most people in America. Right. And when I say most people, I mean most white people. Most rich white people would look at Michael Orr. If they saw him walking down the street, they would lock their doors in fear. If they saw Michael Orr and didn't know he was five star football player, and it's and it, and I and I say this about and this is people ask me why I get so annoyed sometimes when it comes down to talking about college sports. And me and John Martin shared these frustrations, you know, a few weeks ago when he was on here. There are so many situations where you see rich or upper middle class, whatever white people who have a totally different view of a young black man just because he's able to put a basketball through a hoop or score a touchdown. I can go up and down. If, if I saw, if, if I was, if DeAndre Williams was walking down the street, mm -hmm. who would, who would think that DeAndre Williams, you know what I mean? But the fact that he's, you know, dunking basketballs, getting rebounds, blocking shots, playing defense and going and showing hella energy with Memphis across his chest. People take him in like he's one of their kids and they're, 
you know, all these different things you see. Man, I don't care. I don't care what y'all say. And, and I'll just be honest. The kid, um, the kid that, that Memphis just got, um, um, Jaquan. Jaquan uh, Walton. Who would give a damn about that kid's situation or make excuses about that kid's situation if he didn't play basketball? It's because he's doing something for your university, because he plays a sport. Now, oh, it was just, it was just a little weed. It, was, it wasn't no weed, weed. It was just a little, you know, I mean, all these things. But in, in a situation, y'all would call that kid a criminal. You would call that kid a thug, all these type of things. The Tui family targeted Michael Orr, and they benefited off of him because he was a basketball player. They got this kid to go to their alma mater school, got his head coach a job, and I'm sure there was something kicked back to the Tui family for getting him to Ole Miss. And now this kid is... And, and people asking the question, so why why didn't they talk? Why has he just now coming forward with this stuff since he's writing a book? Maybe he's just now realizing what happened to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe he's just now realizing, man, these people really played me. Like, they really thought they ever, And now that I'm a millionaire now, I really see, yeah, man. And you probably also thought I was your, your pet black person. You want me to be honest with you. you. You really thought you were putting a feather in your hat by finding this kid and bringing him up and making this bullshit movie about it. And all these type of things. And if I if it's, if it feels like I'm getting angry about this, it's because I am, Kenny. Because people like me and you worked with kids who we didn't care about that they played basketball for the school and all these stuff. We had definitely a lot of athletes we had influence over. Right. But we just cared about these kids going from where they are to where they've dreamed, prayed, hoped, didn't hope, didn't know existed. All these type of places for these kids. That's the stuff we had passion about. Not if, if there was a freaking benefit we can get off of this kid. And right. He's an athlete, all these type of things. We right. we dealt with the kids who looked like Michael Orr, but didn't move like Michael Orr. But they moved like what you feared Michael Orr probably was about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the type of kids that 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 we worked with, and that's why I have this type of passion. And why this is that Michael Orr story? Because I was we were in the heart of working with kids when this stuff came out. Hundred percent. You know what I mean? I was like, man, get this out of here, man. I don't yeah. have time for this white savior stuff, man. And that, that's clearly what they're doing. That's clearly what they did. Um, and, and honestly, if, and, and we, me and you joke around a lot about how we've grown up and the experiences that yeah. we've had. And you, yeah. you make jokes about, you know, season in the bathtub and, and, and things like that. Like those, those kinds of experiences that we grow up in. Mm -hmm. And, and this hit really home to me because I've grown up in communities where the white savior complex is crazy, is, is prevalent is 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 the way that a lot of people that I grew up with interact with people that don't have the same skin yeah. color as they do. Yeah, man. And and I think that this is the fact that it was from the beginning this movie. And I don't care. People can sit here and say Hollywood embellishes whatever, but they never came out and said none of this is true. They never said the way that this movie is being presented, mm -hmm. the way the story is being presented is not true. And if they genuinely cared, they would have stepped in and said, man, the narrative is, is that Michael Orr is this big homeless kid, homeless, dumb person. We taught to rewrite and, and, and run routes, you know, and, what I mean? <laughs> like, come on, man. And it's, and it's just, it is a, a perpetuation of this sickness that I think yeah. perpetuates white America that people that don't have the same skin color as them that live in different parts mm -hmm. of the city of them need our help need to be saved. Yeah. And that is one of the grossest things that, that is a part yeah. of this society. And if you look in the comment sections, you see, you see the ignorant rhetoric, man, the stuff of, well, you know, uh, he would have been, a, he would have been a statistic if they hadn't done this. And, you know, uh, they helped him to get where he need to be. And he wouldn't have been there without them. And, and this kid was a five-star athlete at Briar, Chris. I'm willing to bet he would have been fine. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. Like we just, we just saying, we're just saying ridiculous things about this situation. I don't care about the, I don't care about what they did, whether it was legal or not, or what. I don't care about any of that, man. But don't sell me the bullshit like you did this out of the kindness of your heart. You did this. You saw this huge, because Michael Orr is a pretty threatening-looking dude. You saw this huge threatening kid who, in any other situation, you'd be terrified of him. And you, you, you turned him towards your school. Now I'm not saying that they had, didn't have any care for him. They didn't take care of him. All, I'm not saying any of those things. But don't act like you did those things with 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 strictly pure motives. You targeted this kid, and I would say that there's in any of the situation, 
Michael Orr is a victim. In any, I don't care what the truth of any of this is. He was, a, he was a victim. I don't care about the timing. I don't care the fact that he's writing a book. That man has realized at this point in life, nah, everything about this shit went straight. Well, and, and I think they gave the game away when they gave their statements and the majority of the conversation from the, the two side mm-hmm. of the thing was about money. Yeah. Because in the end, when you start to complain and declare certain things as this is what this person is focused on and they want this, this, and this. What I'm hearing is, is that that's what motivated them mm. is the money. And it, again, like I said from the beginning, it doesn't matter the amount. I could give two shits about the amount of right. money that was made in royalties off that Because he's made his own money. He's made his own money mm-hmm. and he was going to make his own money. Regardless. Regardless. Yep. But it's the principle of the, of the fact that you weaponized his story to make yourself look like you did something that you didn't like you do. Just, he's amazing people. And you capitalized off that mm-hmm. all the while using Michael Orr as a pawn. And mm-hmm. that, that to me is just it's, it's nasty work, man. Nasty. Nasty ass work, man. It's nasty. And, and regardless of how you look at this, it's um, like you said, man, they clearly benefit off of this. It made them look amazing. Make them look like they just found this, you know, this big kid with nowhere to live and took him in and sh- introduced him to sports and sports changed his life. <laughs> like, it, that's not what happened, man. It's clearly not what happened. You you targeted a kid who was who was an elite level athlete anyway. Uh, got that kid to move in with you. You steered him to the school you want him to go to. All these type of things. Um, you did not have to get a con- con- conservatorship at all because you could you could have got this kid to go to another school. The only reason why you got that is because there was a conflict of interest. Sean Tui was a was a donor booster at Ole Miss. Right. So to get that kid to go there, he would have had to be family. So they signed this conservatorship to get that done. You could have sent the kid anywhere. He didn't have to go to Ole Miss. You and didn't have to, to do any of this. And there's a scene in the movie. And I listen, people can, uh, like, again, I'll say it. They can say Hollywood embellishes, whatever. But they mm-hmm. never came out and said this wasn't true. No. There was a scene in the movie in one of the most emotional scenes in the movie where they sat down in the living room and said, we want you to be a part of our family. Mm-hmm. And if you, if what we know about what's really the truth behind the matter, that conversation probably never happened. Right. And then here's, here's the killer. Yeah, exactly. Here's the killer part too. They're saying now, like, well, first of all, they're saying, well, Michael told us, you know, if, if, you know, this was coming, like there was, he was going to put out negative information and we didn't send him his money. No man, he's put out accurate information. He put out the truth. Like he didn't. If if your if your truth is negative, I mean it's not his fault, bro. Like what is he? What do you What do you mean? Like he's putting out accurate information, man. So what are you What are you What are you mad about? Like it's it's all crazy. It's all wild. Um, I hate it. I hate it for the man. Um, it all looks super. It all it all looks terrible. It makes the Tui family look horrible. I've heard you know horrible stories about them anyway. Um, and truth be told, man, I'm, I'm proud of Michael Orr for, yeah. for doing this. Coming man. For, yeah. Like it takes a lot. Of, listen, mm. he's put himself in a very vulnerable position. Yeah. And I'm pr- like, I think that no matter what ends up happening with all of this, I think he deserves kudos mm. for owning the situation and saying, no, this is the truth. No matter what repercussions happen. Right. And last thing I'll say too, there's also Sean Tui's also came out and said, "Man, we'll we'll take this off now. Like you know, we never meant to hold this the conservatorship over his head. We'll take it off if if, if, if he ever wanted to go, we would have taken it off. Man, what? It's not his responsibility, man. man. He was a child when you put him on this. Man, you should have taken this off soon as he soon as he signed an old Miss. You could have killed it. You've kept this going the entire time he's been in the NFL, man. And it just <laughs> makes you wonder what what moves have they made? Could they have made?" It's not his responsibility, man. You you put him under this. He didn't know what it was. So why why does he have to come to you and say, hey, can you take that off? No. You should have been the adult. You should have taken it off a long time ago. That's what make this shit look slick as hell, man. Like, I don't want to hear it. Y'all are full of shit. I'm I'm riding with Michael Orr with this whole situation. And, you know, get out of here, man. But, yeah, we're about to take a break, bro. <laughs> when we come back, my man Clayton Collier is going to join us for the sit down with Sane. Uh, this Michael Orr stuff is going to continue to unfold. We're going to see more information about that, of course. We like, like I said, about to go to a break. When we come back, the sit down with Sane is going to be here on the Anthony Sane Show. See you guys in a minute. They got.
got picked fourth in that in that poll, the the preseason media poll, and uh, I, I I don't think that would be a good finish for this team this year. No. I think they need to aspire way higher than that, and I don't see why they shouldn't. Tulane and UTSA may be good teams, but they're not world beaters. They're not teams that you should preclude yourself from beating if you want to get to the spot you want to be. And if you were to want to be a Power 5 school, which the University of Memphis wants to be in athletics, you have to beat teams like that. Have so to. the aspirations still need to be high for this program. Tune into On the Bluff with Christian Fowler and Gabe Kuhn every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. Will Memphis play a team of that caliber in the regular season this year? Wow. I asked a similar question, and I'm going to say no, because I don't know. With, the, are we talking like four legitimate NBA guys? That's what I'm saying. Like, they have absolute NBA players. Like, what team are you going to play that has I mean, that I think there's, probably, there's probably a, a potential in the Bahamas, Atlantis, Battle for Atlantis. I mean, on you're talking team? On one team. I mean, I think it depends on who you get matched up. That is so rare. From Four. A prof- I know, TJ, from a professional standpoint, probably not. Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. So welcome back to the Anthony the Sane Show. Y'all know what time it is. It's a sit down with Sane. Got my man. He's about to get up out of here, man, from ABC 24. He's currently in ABC 24 or leaving ABC 24, one or two, something like my that. My last day was last Friday. Well, yeah, there Friday. it is. My man, Clayton Collier, <laughs> man, is my man. Y'all seen me and him do our thing together on uh, 901 Sports X, uh, XL on ABC 24. We did it every Sunday, all this, this entire basketball season, man. And I, I thank you for that as well, bro. For, for, thank for having, you. Had me on awesome. TV looking good out here, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Every Sunday, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, for sure. My man, Clayton Collier. Clayton, like I said, you're headed to uh, Omaha, Nebraska as their sports director. It sounds like an upgrade. Sounds like you got a promotion to me. Uh, what are you most looking forward to out there in the land of Nebraska? Yeah, uh, you know, I know we're, we're going to talk about it, but, mm. you know, my wife and I are going to miss Memphis so much. But, yeah. but Omaha, uh, what that brings, I mean, Huge, passionate Big Ten football mm-hmm. fan base there with Nebraska. 389 consecutive sellouts right. of a massive stadium over 60 years. I mean, the, the the passion that they have in that area of the country for football is incredible. Mm-hmm. And then you have Creighton, top 10 uh, preseason team as mm-hmm. well. Um, yeah. You know, it should have been a Final Four team if not for that bad call uh, against San Diego State. And then obviously the College World Series as well. So there's there's yeah. a it's a really good college sports town as well. There's not a pro team in the market, but yeah. there's – there's a lot of really good sports in that city, and I'm looking forward to getting after it. What pro team to do the people there lean towards? Is it? Uh, I mean, Kansas City is, okay. is about four hours south. Mm-hmm. Um, Minnesota or Minneapolis is like five and a half hours to the east. So I imagine it's it's probably going to be yeah. a little bit of a blend of that. They probably pulled for a lot of teams. They yeah. probably have a lot of people who just have national fan bases or whatever. Um, you spoke about leaving Memphis. You posted a very, very, very authentic – very heartfelt goodbye to the city of Memphis. Um, what were you miss most about being here? Yeah, um, you know, I, I meant every word when mm-hmm. I was talking about it. You know, we just love how much character, how much, you know, unique history there is in this city. I mean, I learned a lot being here. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, whether that's music history, civil rights history, there's just so much in this city. And there's right. so many cities across the country that, you know, there's just, you know, buildings and condos and there's there's nothing really like to it that makes it its own mm-hmm. or it's kind of manufactured like Memphis just is. And it's, you know, I was talking to my, my wife and I had a dinner with Eric Vernon over a barbecue shop on uh, Sunday night. Mm-hmm. And he said, when I was talking about all the character, he kind of cut me off. He said, Memphis is real. I was like, yeah, yeah. It, it really is. And that's really like it's very authentically itself. And mm-hmm. that's something that that we've really bought into and really enjoy here. And uh, that's something I'm really going to miss. But also, Memphis is a city, and I love this about this city in general. Mm-hmm. It's always a city that's willing to try. Right. No matter what it is, like more often than not, you're willing to try. And a lot of the times, it works out great. You have the Grizzlies, the new mm-hmm. Memphis Sports and Events Center at Liberty right. Park. Like, mm-hmm. that thing is cooking. Oh, and that yeah, was man. an awesome addition. 16 <laughs> yep. courts out there. I mean, I was talking yeah, to a people. a lot of people doubted it, but it's, yeah, it's awesome, I, man. I yeah. didn't really 
uh, it's not that I was doubting it. I didn't really like understand like, oh, like, okay, I guess that's cool. Cause a lot of the big like high school tournaments would be like Bartlett or Briarcrest kind of all like in mm -hmm. like four or five locations. And now you have that central spot. So that's kind of cool. And then I saw this summer with the EYBL and everything else, but going back to my point, Memphis is always willing to try. Sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You have like mm -hmm. the Memphis express. And sometimes you end up with a Bass Pro Pyramid with a bat, you know, like in, in the middle of downtown. <laughs> so but, to make it doesn't yeah, make any sense, but it's, but they're yeah. always willing to try to to you know, and not just resting on the laurels of like, hey, we've got some great history. We got Beale Street. We've got you know Graceland down there. We got right. you know we got some good things. Like hey, you know, I, I think we're doing all right. Like Memphis is always trying to push forward, right? And I, I really love that about this city. And I'll add to what you're saying about Memphis being authentic. Memphis being real. You know, they say real recognizes real. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, that's that's something with you. I, I don't think I really connected with you or really met you or had a conversation with you until I think maybe four years ago, Jaws' mm -hmm. rookie year. I yeah. got to know you then. And you're a real dude, man. You know what I mean? And Appreciate I, I that. saw <laughs> Same with you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, man. I remember you having a conversation about a question that it was a question that you were instructed to ask. You was like, man, I don't want to ask this shit at all, man. It was like a tough loss we had or something. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, this dude was real, man. Like he was, he he didn't come out here with the with the Johnny journalism hat on, like you know, <laughs> by any means necessary. You was like, man, I honestly don't want to talk about this. Like I'm, and you were, you expressed an anxiety and the nervousness you had of asking a question that you were told from up above you had to ask that you didn't want to yeah and that that's real man you know what i mean yeah, so, yeah no i mean at the end of the day for me when i go in like there's there's questions that everybody like you know it, if there's an injury like we want to ask an injury update right. like it, it's pretty clear in that respect but like for me i i just kind of go in thinking like what is this person what is this player maybe thinking mm -hmm. that's going to get them out of their own mentality of the canned answers that they have because mm -hmm. i mean all those guys especially with the grizzlies have media training and it's mm -hmm. like you know what's something I can ask that's that's relevant, that's thought provoking, that may, you know, get them out of that zone a little bit because mm -hmm. it's very easy for them. They don't, you know, half the time they don't want to be there. Right. And they don't want, <laughs> you know, especially after a loss. And uh -huh. so like what can I ask that that's that's gonna, you know, get them out of that and wake them right. up and make them like actually think about the question I asked and not what playback response mm -hmm. do I have to give you. Yeah, exactly. So, so when I when I first saw your name, I saw I saw your name, of course, on Twitter, TV, and things before I met you in person. And I assumed you were from the legendary Collier family in the in what <laughs> the founders of Collierville. Oh yeah, I thought you I, I thought you were from that. the legendary <laughs> Collier family when I first uh, met you, or whatever. But come to find out, you weren't from here. Uh, like I said, which is which speaks to you know you're a real dude, man. Like I thought you were from the M. So, but what, what got you here in the first place? Tell us the path that what got you, because you're from New York. Yeah. What got you from New York to Memphis? Yeah, so I went to Seton Hall, mm -hmm. um, Big East basketball. That's what I, I knew. My first uh, game ever was uh, a St. John's exhibition game mm -hmm. when I was like <laughs> six at the Garden. Um, so my, you apply like crazy coming out of college, trying to find a job. I found one in Bismarck, North Dakota mm -hmm. as a weekend sports anchor. And I remember looking out the plane <laughs> as we're landing. I'd never lived more than an hour, hour and a half from the city. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking out, like trying to see where the skyline is. I'm like, oh, there's corn. There, there's no, there's <laughs> no right. skyline. Some here. Fields. <laughs> Ain't no skyline. So uh, that was, that was definitely an interesting experience. But then I, I met my wife out there as well. And mm -hmm. we met some great people there. And then I got the job here. Um, and, you know, my wife who's my girlfriend at the time filed me down mm -hmm. and we we got married here in memphis we got married uh over at, at ansdale mid midtown mm -hmm. um and that was one of the coolest things like you know you talk about like cool sports moments that you get to be part of everything mm -hmm. one of the coolest moments the last six years here was obviously getting married right. um but <laughs> we had you know all of our friends from you know she's from montana originally from montana north dakota from mm -hmm. new york from new jersey on my side all coming here and I had so many people say, wow, I never would have been to the city if it wasn't for this. And I'm so yeah. glad I did. And like, you yeah. know, seeing the National Civil Rights Museum, you know, plenty of them went and saw, you know, Graceland and everything else. Um, right. So that that was cool. Like, hey, we got to share this with everybody. And now like when, after getting married, everybody we talked mm -hmm. to were like, oh, there's this place in Memphis with our friends that are out of town. They're like, oh yeah, we know. <laughs> and it, it, it's like a cool feeling yeah, we, that we way. Did, like, did. Yeah, yeah, we've been there, done it. <laughs> so uh, you were talking earlier about how you know going into Omaha, that's a big college sports town, mm -hmm. college football, baseball, World Series, all those type of things, Creighton, all those type of things. Um, what did you hear about Memphis? What were your expectations as far as the sports scene here yeah. when you were headed to to work here in this market? I knew that 
Grizzlies fans were passionate. I mm-hmm. knew that much. Um, you know, I knew about the you know, grit and grind was kind of like scaling down there that, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think honestly, like in, in my job interview and everything, they were talking a lot about how much they did with Ole Miss football. Right. Because at the time, like, you know, Tigers, Tigers football mm-hmm. was just kind of starting to rise. I got here in September 2017. Um, and that was kind of more of my more or less my expectation and that everybody was really passionate about tigers men's basketball mm-hmm. although it was you know kind of in the lull it, i got here right before tubby's final yeah season. you came here doing, doing yeah. kind of a weird transitional period for the grizzlies and the tigers yeah, yeah yeah i mean my my first week here was when tony allen signed with the pelicans mm. i'm pretty sure no oh, you you yeah. literally were here for yeah, the transition right at the of, end yeah uh-huh. and then uh you know for tubby obviously it wasn't it wasn't going you know terrific <clears> in terms of getting big name players mm-hmm. generating excitement like he had the wins there right but i'm glad i came when i did because one of my favorite memories here is still seeing that east high state championship and being mm-hmm. out there in murfreesboro after tubby had you know parted ways and penny's team you mean yeah yeah, 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 yeah. East high, okay yeah, yeah his final championship mm-hmm. and watching that true rise so i actually got a taste of like yeah. where this was coming from as opposed to like uh you know a year or two after the fact it'd be like oh, okay like you know, Memphis's son is is here right. as the Tigers head coach. Like seeing that East High thing is such you know a, a valuable chapter of this story, mm-hmm. and I'm glad I got to get a full year of that right. with Penny in there to, to to actually see like, hey, like this is not where it started, but like this is a, an important part of that of mm-hmm. that entire story of Penny and, and the Tigers. Right, and you mentioned you mentioned covering Penny even before he was the coach at the University of Memphis. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he's a big deal as far as guys as you've you know oh, yeah. covered. Or whatever. I mean, I remember Little Penny all over. Right. Yeah, of course. So who would be who would be your Mount Rushmore, so to speak, of just sports personalities here in Memphis? Whether they be players, coaches, executives. Whatever. So, you mean in the in the time that I've been it's here? since you've been here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Since so, you've covered Memphis area sports, right? So Which, since give, we've throw established, out a, throw out a year so people know. Yeah. So September 2017 is when I got okay. here. Okay. Right. So that's you know pretty much six years on the nose. Mm. Um. So no disrespect at all to Mike Conley and Marcus Gasol's contribution mm-hmm. to the Grizzlies, but I got here for the when tail they were on end. The way about it is, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so the I trade mean, requests were going down. Penny Hardaway obviously mm-hmm. he br- he comes back. Everything else, you know, all the recruiting classes, all the excitement, everything. Mm-hmm. Sure, absolutely. Um, Jaron and Ja, I think both have to be up okay. there. Um, and the fourth one I was struggling with, but I think I found an off the wall answer. Okay, I'm gonna go with Jim Strickland. <laughs> All right, explain Jim Strickland <laughs> with an asterisk. Um, <laughs> if he's if he's the one getting it done to get that stadium money into the city mm-hmm. that keeps the Grizzlies here long term, gets them beyond that next deal, that's the biggest impact that I've seen here. All right, with that being said, how do you think they should use that money? Yeah, um, number one, you got to do everything you can to keep the Grizzlies here in mm-hmm. the city. Um, beyond that, now the Tigers definitely you know need their share in terms of moving up, you know, in, in terms of conference mm-hmm. realignment and everything like that. Um, but I think the fact that we haven't maybe seen an exact, you know, divide up of what the numbers are tells mm. me that there's probably some negotiating going on right now and some, mm. some figuring out what the divvying right. up actually is. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work that's got to be done at FedEx Forum. Obviously, ter- that that terrace level has got to get fixed to some extent because mm. what is it? It's 50 five 50 50 Something plus like percent mm-hmm. is at terrace level that that doesn't work for a lot of situations you know when it yeah. comes to, to to stadiums across the country and i'm sure that's that's one of the biggest things on the renovation list but um no i mean i, I don't think it's any secret the the grizzlies are going to get the lion's share of that and 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 you know the the tigers certainly how much they get i think mm. they were what was it 150 that they're planning on yeah out of that <clears throat> um something like that yeah so to be determined on that, but you, you know, Grizzlies number one, the Tigers, you know, in terms of the stadium renovations are, you know, your, your solid number two, and then, you know, 901 FC and, and, um, the Redbirds are obviously, um, mm. right, right beyond that as well. So here's another thing you talked about, you headed to big 10 country. Mm-hmm. So do you give a damn about Memphis being outside looking in or I'm joking with uh, you, but seriously yeah, yeah. though, like, what are your thoughts about that? Like we've been on the outside looking in for a while as far as, you know, getting to a major conference is concerned, like, what do you, as someone who, you've been a, you've been the citizen of the city through this mm-hmm. entire time. Yeah. Every realignment conversation you've been a part of, talking about on, on the news, whatever. What do you, what's your honest assessment of, of how you feel, as a citizen of Memphis, leaving now, of course, mm-hmm. but how do you feel about it? I'd like to see Memphis obviously move up in terms mm-hmm. of that, because now it just, it, it feels like what it is, that they're one of the, 
the best remaining mm -hmm. college programs out there that just haven't been picked up yet. And it's unfortunate because after this last go around with, with the big 12, it felt like Memphis and Boise state were kind of the next in line to move up to the big 12. Mm -hmm. And then there's all this other chaos and the PAC 12 falls apart. And suddenly you're, you're still trying to figure right. out what, where you land now. Is right. that the ACC? Is that an option now moving forward? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's unfortunate because Memphis's pinnacle football moment happened <clears throat> two months before the pandemic occurred. Yeah. And it was just, you know, everybody had had situations that that were impacted on a, you know, a variety of fronts, especially, mm -hmm. but I'm talking specifically about sports. Like it's just so unfortunate that the pinnacle moment of that entire program happens right there and just completely knocks out any momentum possible. Yeah. Even if it, you know, they did regress a little bit right. um, that, just there there wasn't that momentum anyway so there needed to be like a real jolt to get people mm -hmm. going again excited about tigers football because as we've seen historically that's not an easy thing to get to yeah. build to and yeah. that was a long time coming getting to that cotton Bowl. i hadn't thought about that a um, couple months later the whole world said now yeah. yeah and so <laughs> <laughs> didn't think about that at um, all man you yeah. know and and that's not to say that that's that's the reason for you know them mm -hmm. not being at that level again but but it's it's very important for Tigers football to prove that the Cotton Bowl and the success that they had in those years is not an anomaly, mm -hmm. and that's where they are now. And it, you know, they they haven't they've been making bowls, they've been winning bowl games. You know, they they're not far off in that respect. Mm -hmm. But you know, they this is the time, especially in a realigned and a weaker conference, this is the time to show, hey, we're here. Yeah. Well, Memphis has been pretty left behind in AAC on the outside looking in, like we mm -hmm. talked about. But basketball seems to be. Fine. Penny Hardaway put in a tremendous, you know, class of, of guys he's putting together. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, like, I mean, I'm talking about, like, for real, 11th hour type. Yeah, let me I just mean, go ahead and put together a real dope class for y'all right quick. Talk. We we had him, uh, he had availability with us at at mm -hmm. the golf tournament for the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, and that was right after DeAndre said, oh, yeah, like, I'm, I'm going to try to to get a waiver. Mm -hmm. Uh so at that point, we're, we're saying, hey, you have everything going on with Mikey Williams. You you now have this kind of level of uncertainty with DeAndre Williams. Like, what is your team going to look like? And there's this big question mark. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, we're figuring it out. And a month later, he I'll figured it happen. out. Like, right? Like, <laughs> it, he just built a roster in, in a month and a half. I mean, we've seen some incredible stuff from Penny mm -hmm. where he's been able to get things done with number one recruiting classes twice. Um, you know, we saw the the syllabus week where Amani Bates, you know, finally committed mm -hmm. and everything. And obviously that didn't go quite as everybody had hoped. But I mean, Penny gets it gets the job done yeah. when it comes to putting together yeah. a roster. And he's not gonna I I don't think he's had a year where he's gone in without really, you know, putting it together. Right. Um, and that's not easy to do. And all these college coaches that have retired, a lot of these legendary figures. I don't think it's unrelated that the transfer portal and NIL pops up and they say, yeah, I'm good to call it a career. But Penny just seems so well equipped to go oh, yeah. right after it and yeah. like says, like, I'm made for this. And, and he's he's played it in, incredibly well where a lot of coaches are trying to figure out how all this situation works. It's not easy mm -hmm. having, to, having to put together a full new roster every year. And that's, I think, where a lot of these guys, like, you know, your Coach K's, your Roy Williams right. of the world said, you know, hey – I'm going to sit that, you know, I, I've had a good run. Like I, I don't need to be doing this. Like, yeah. you know, this is, this is a lot different than, than anything but I've I'm done for the last, yeah. you know, 30, 40 years. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, but Penny's doing it and, and, you know, they deserve uh, to be at least in the conversation for the top 25, um, you know, if not higher yeah. uh, going into this year. So, and not only is Penny doing it, man, it's almost like he's taking it to the next level. Cause he's like, all right, you got your one and done's go get your mm -hmm. one and done's. Go get me, go get me to like semi pro ish guys who are like, yeah. I'm gonna wait on these dudes who are gonna try to go to the NBA, and then when you guys have already gave all your NIL money, all your scholarships away, I'm gonna go get these guys who changed their mind about the league. It's yeah. <laughs> like he's like ahead of the game on that. Like he, yeah. he's he's cheat coding as far as this concerned. But it's it's wild stuff for sure with Penny, man. Uh, of course, with the the John Moran situation, he's gonna be out 25 games. Um, Zach Kleiman, who you've been mistaken for. It, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, uh, Clayton had a quote, and what was it? Clutch points. I didn't, have a, like, I didn't have a quote. No, it was. It was he Zach had a, had point. a quote. Yeah, yeah, about how yeah. John was going to be an all star. Yeah, and then 
somebody uh, Quote, somebody yeah. clutch points quoted him and had your face on there yeah. and Zach Climate. Yeah. Um which is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, Le- the legendary uh Zach Climate meme. Forgot about that. But yeah. And it was the worst picture of me too. Oh yeah, man. I looked like <laughs> I, you know, I, I looked like I had my hand in the cookie jar or something like that. And I was uh that yeah, was back call- when we had to do in the pandemic, uh, do stand ups in front of my bookcase at home mm-hmm. where I, I couldn't go to the studio for a oh, year yeah, yeah, with yeah. COVID. So it was one of those that just was not a good shot. Oh was, man, that's so crazy. Yeah. It was mid pandemic. It was it was just about the worst picture of me too. They couldn't yeah. have, they couldn't have found a headshot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh with that being said, uh Zach Kleinman said, you know, he announced that Ja, Jaron, and Bain are the leaders of the team. They mm-hmm. are the leaders. One of your leaders is gonna be down, Ja Morant. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the Grizzlies? I'm sure you're still gonna be a Grizzlies fan when you when you move on. What do you think about the Grizzlies' future, the short term future this year without Ja? When you have Bain and Jaron, they have to step up and be your leader scoring and you know just as being vocal leaders on the team. Yeah, I think if anything good came out of this this whole situation mm-hmm. with Ja, I think it was it was a reminder for everybody about what they have in both Jaron and Dez, both on mm-hmm. and off the court. Because, you know, a couple of years ago, there was there was the talk of like, hey, Jaron isn't really putting it together. Is this a guy that we could, you know, trade and, and do this or that with? And, you know, at least trade people making trade machines. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think there it helps when he, make, get, you know, gets defensive player of the year. But, um, you know, these are guys that have never had any type of issue whatsoever mm-hmm. and that, you know, are, are getting it done. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's not a knock on jaw. That's just, you know, saying, hey, you know, really have to value the guys that you have here. And I think Mm -hmm. it'll be a good opportunity for them as well to, to get some um, variety in as well and, and mesh with Marcus smart. I think the biggest key is, is how John Moran and Marcus smart end up meshing once he comes back because Marcus smarts, a vocal guy. He's not going to take much BS. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the Grizzlies had some very solid veteran leadership in the past, in the few years, but a lot of them, were lead by example yeah, types they or quieter. The vocal Smart type like Stephen Adams yeah. isn't afraid to say, say something. Like obviously we know the report that mm-hmm. you know he <clears throat> kind of about the indirectly life, was saying yeah. like you can't be going out. Mm-hmm. Um, Marcus Smart's not going to parse words. Yeah. Marcus I, Smart might yeah. like show where you at. Like hey, man, what you doing, so dumbass? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What those types of things? So are. you know how how John Morant responds to that? You know. I don't know, you know, and only John Morant knows that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's going to be pretty essential to the season. I don't yeah. think we've talked quite enough about, you know, how big that that's going to be, like in terms of play style and in terms of leadership, you know, how does he come back? Um, you know, that that first time after that first suspension, I remember asking Des, like, mm-hmm. you know, leadership wise, does he just snap back into where he was? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious if this time around that yeah. that tone maybe changes a little bit now that there's, some veterans that are in there, Marcus Smart, Derek mm-hmm. Rose. Uh, clearly, this front office saw that as the issue. Um, whether or not justly or not, Dylan Brooks, they decided that that was part of the problem mm-hmm. there uh, and that Marcus Smart and Derek Rose were part of the solution on yeah. on multiple fronts. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly hope that, that Ja comes back, he's good to go, and that, you know, has learned from this and that, you know, this is – a minor, you know, thumbnail on his Wikipedia mm. page of his career. Right, right. <laughs> I've got one other not so serious question, but the last major sports question I ask you, of course, this is my man Clayton Collier, former ABC Twenty Four, on his way to Omaha, Nebraska, to be the sports director for what's the station you're going to? W O W T. There it is. Y'all write that down. <laughs> Go check him out. I'm sure they got a website. Go check him out. Um, the Michael Orr situation, clearly mm. the biggest sports news of the day. Yeah. Um, of this week. Not just locally, but this is a this is a major story mm-hmm. we're talking about. Uh, what are your general thoughts on that whole situation? Yeah, um, something that of course happened yeah. way before you got here. But, I mean, my yeah, yeah, my first experience in in terms of knowing that story was watching The Blind Side, right? Mm-hmm. And then later on learned that there's a lot of it that really isn't that true. Mm-hmm. And so that's always been something that about that story that never really sat right. Um, it was really disappointing to see that that ESPN an art, yeah. article come out and you know what. Um, Michael Lohr's claiming, uh, and if that's true, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, it, it paints a picture of, you know, exploiting for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, how much of that, you know, I, I try not to take everything too much at face value from what a lawsuit, you know, claims one way or the other, just because like, you know, if we took everything Joshua Holloway said at face right. value in the John Morant situation, yeah. you know, there's how would we look at it? Yeah. yeah so um, I'm not, I'm not like condemning, you know, one or the other on anything on that. I just think that, you know, it, it's really unfortunate because it's it's not only a story, but it's 
it's what people at least what initially I took it as is something that people should be doing, seeing somebody in need and doing what they can to help them. Right. And that's always been an uplifting story. And if that's not what happened and that's what Michael Orr is claiming now, that's really, yeah. you know, disappointing. And, Terrible. And, and if not only the, if it's true to be the, the guise of helping in order to exploit, that's even worse. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we talked about this in the beginning of the show, of course, but my thing is, would you have helped him if he wasn't this gigantic mm -hmm. future NFL pro? Yeah, football that's a good question. Because he actually looks like the face of fear in America. If you right. just want to be yeah. honest, <laughs> I just throw out that blanket statement. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I just wonder how much would they have. That's my. That's always been my thing about this whole situation. Would you have cared about this kid if he didn't play football? Yeah, no, and you know it, what I mean. So it, it that's always a question that that I've wondered too after knowing mm -hmm. that that wasn't like that portrayal was not accurate, and mm -hmm. you don't know like you know along the way between you know a family, a writer, and then you know film producers like mm -hmm. who exactly mm -hmm. twisted that into what it is. But right. I mean. Michael Lord, you know, before all this has talked about how much that's that's haunted him that, mm -hmm. you know, in his career that people thought he wasn't educated on the game or that he wasn't smart or he wasn't like good enough for a lot of things, if right. not for this white family coming right. in and helping. Mm -hmm. Um, and that wasn't the case, but that's how it ended up being portrayed yeah. as this really, you know, kind of over the top white savior family yeah. um or story. Um and that it's unfortunate that it it hit him in that way personally. And then now he's saying not only that, but he got, you know, screwed over financially yeah. as well. It, it's, yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, it's really sad to see. Yeah. I'm with you, man, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Final question for you, uh, Clayton Collier. Um, in your time here, a lot of people credit you as being the best question asker in, <laughs> in Memphis media, whether it's at a scrum or whatever, on the news, whatever you're doing. Everyone says that Clayton Collier asks such great questions. Let me ask you this, Clayton Collier. When you're getting when you're getting your thoughts together, do you come in with your swag and your confidence like these country bumpkins? Let me go ahead and show these folks <laughs> how to ask questions. Or it's just something that just comes out natural, man. Are you no. intention are you intentionally saying, okay, let me come in with a bomb ass question for these folks or or do I? No. Um, <laughs> but you've heard I, those you've heard those kind of compliments before. Yeah, it's very nice of people to say as well. Yeah. And you ask great questions. Oh, too. thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but um no, I like I said earlier, I just I try to put myself in somebody else's perspective the best I can with anything mm -hmm. when it's like doing a story on somebody or, or trying to rationalize, like, you know, how did this situation happen? Whether it's a Michael Orr or John Morant, you know, uh, everything with, with all these instances, like mm -hmm. trying to fit, like see everything from a lot of different sides. So when I go into something, it could be simple as like, you know, just an injury or a, a new guy mm -hmm. showing up and everything. Um, I try to think about that and, and think what they might, you know, be, like I said, be thinking mm -hmm. about that's outside of the the five to 10 canned answers yeah. that somebody's handed them to say if they can't think of someone to say with a question right. or somebody asks a question they really don't understand, so they just give them that canned answer so they can move on. I want to, my goal is to try to make somebody think yeah. and maybe think about something that hasn't been asked before. Um, so if I've accomplished that and I get a good answer, then I, then I feel like I did my job. Um, I also know that there's like a list of, you know, five to 10 questions or so that we've got to ask right. like this, the collective group of us is asked. So I have my question or two there in my head of like what I want to ask, but I got to make sure that, you know, everything else does. So I kind of wait a while and just see if mm -hmm. the obvious gets asked. And then, you know, if we got time, I'll, I'll throw something in that might be a little off the wall. And sometimes <laughs> I get somebody looking at me like, what the heck are you talking about? Right. And I was like, okay, well then probably I went, I went too deep too down deep the rabbit deep. hole in my own head. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so you you ain't stunned. You just it's just being real. It's just being you. Yeah. I just try to think about you know like yeah. if I'm if I'm asking you a question <laughs> or so like what like how was your day and, and the things that were uh, going on in your day and maybe how is that leading to where you are now? Yeah. Cause so. see that's why we love you, man. You keep it real. This Memphis, man. Hey, what <laughs> what I say in that press conference to John Morant? This rookie year is introductory joint. If if you love Memphis, Memphis will love you back. Bro. That's right. And you keep it real, that. and we keep it real with you, man. Anthony, I have a question Go for ahead. for Clayton before he gets out of here. Uh, we've <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the voice of the yeah. They, I, I've been called Anthony's white conscience <laughs> on this. <laughs> on this Anthony, don't say it, Anthony. You know you know how they're gonna respond. Don't say that, Anthony. Um, Think about the other side of the Michael Orr situation. <laughs> ain't no other side. There ain't no other side. <laughs> when this turned into a Dave Chappelle skit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you. You, it, It's interesting, man. Like, you've been around media over really across the country and, mm -hmm. and you know, been involved in a lot of it. You know, you've been here for six years. 
Um, one of the things that I've known about you being able to work alongside you, most of the time our cameras are, st- are sitting next to each other when mm-hmm. we're at availabilities and things like that is right, right. Yeah. you kind of stay out of the fray a lot. You know, you know how, mm-hmm. you know how dirty and nasty yeah. media business can be. Um, what would you say, like as you're leaving mm-hmm. and you're kind of looking over the landscape of Memphis media and how, how media members are covering the sports teams here, mm-hmm. what would you say, like, piece of advice or how could how could Memphis media be better yeah man yeah that's a really good question uh he's the one that's really yeah man that's a a hell of a question (laughs) to the question ask him um I'd say don't be afraid to ask the the tough questions Mm. I think sometimes like in Memphis and I get why like I'm from New York so there's like eight different teams so like no part of those teams are just New York or like you know, anything like that. Like oh, the Grizzlies brand. are Memphis. Mm-hmm. Like the Tigers are Memphis. So I think sometimes we do misconstrue like pointed criticism as like hate towards the team and by extension Memphis, which I, right. I get because Memphis is unfairly attacked in a lot of ways all the time. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's above somebody asking, you know, a, fair criticism or something mm-hmm. like, you know, about yeah. strategy or this, that obviously right. be prepared to defend it. But, um, I think sometimes that, that would be what I would say is maybe don't be afraid to ask, you know, you know, thought provoking or, you know, maybe, uh, somewhat digging of a question sometimes, as long as it's, as it's respectful and it's, you know, appropriate in the setting. But, um, yeah, that, that's probably what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> But well, that's what's up, man. It's my man Clayton Carr. You about to get up out of here, man. The man is spending his final hours in Memphis right now, and he decided to spend thirty minutes of that with your boy on the Anthony Saint Show. I appreciate you coming on today. Hey, man. thank you so much for having me. Man, it's an for honor, sure, man. man. For sure. Thank you. We about to take a break, guys. When we come back, y'all know what's coming. It's a three pointer here on the Anthony Saint Show. See y'all in a minute. Has FAU somersaulted over a lot of other teams as like your most aggravating fan base? Oh, easily. They just think they are so elite because they made this one run. You won this one fluky ass game where there were six or seven different calls. Everyone were up in arms about like, what what are we talking about? And it's not like a thing where they're like, hey, Memphis, great game. You guys are great competitors. I can't wait to see what the future holds between us. Because if they said that, I would respect them. I don't respect FAU fans. I don't. Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. What's up, guys? I'm so excited to announce that we have partnered with Coaching for Literacy, and you can read more about them at coachingforliteracy.org or follow them on social media at Coaching for Literacy. Your subscription to Bluff City NIL is 100% tax deductible because of our partnership together. Thank you for supporting Memphis Tiger student athletes and helping promote the monumental cause of childhood literacy. Welcome back to the Anthony Sane Show. Shout out to my boy Clayton Collier. Great interview with Clayton, man. He was uh, Clayton was kind of shoot off, shooting off on some of this stuff. That Jim Strickland one kind of threw me on him. Threw me, threw me for yeah, the, yeah, you know. I, I usually try not to laugh that loud in the background, <laughs> but that was funny. Wasn't expecting Jim yeah, Strickland's man. name what to a, pop up in that Mount Rushmore. Yeah, not at all. Not at all, for sure. Um, He's a good dude, though. Oh, man. yeah, my guy, man. Clayton Collier. Uh, wish him the best, man. Like I uh I used to always, whenever I would see him at the games, I'd say, show us your face, Clayton, from the uh, Dave Chappelle, <laughs> uh, white, black, white, Dude, black supremacist. The, black, the white black supremacist. Clay, the black KKK yeah, member. Uh, oh my yeah, because his name was Clayton Bigsby, and that guy was like, show us your face. Oh I used to always God. say it to Clayton every time I saw him at the games. But yeah, man, the three-pointer, uh, when we talk about three uh, uh, big-time uh, sports events, things that are going on in the world of sports. Uh, number one, FIBA basketball over the weekend. Man, I will say this, bro. United States defeated Spain, uh, beat them by, I think, double digits. I think it was 10. like 10 points, something like yep. that. Spain was the number one seed in the world. Uh, Kenny Stubblefield got that ass smack. I think they were in Spain, too, if I'm not mistaken. They were in Spain. This was a, a true road game uh, for the United States team. 
It felt like the Dominican Republic live stream all over. Yeah, didn't it, man? Didn't it? <laughs> it was wild in there. I thought it was gonna be more of a but it didn't really feel like a, a like a hornet's nest though. It, it kind of I don't know, man. It yeah. Didn't, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like we were in front of a hostile Spanish crowd. You know, we when we got that win or whatever. Did you think flares were gonna go off in the crowd? Man, I didn't know what it was gonna be. I mean, I saw I saw like that WWE event that was like in Puerto Rico when people were like it was wild. Yeah, I thought it was gonna be crazy in there, but like with none Bad, of that going on. When Bad Bunny came out, exactly. <laughs> I thought it was gonna, wild. I thought it was gonna be nuts in there, man. With none of that going on at all, United States got up in that ass, uh, beating the number one seed, the Spanish team. Uh, Jalen Brunson out there looking like Captain America for real. God, dude. like that dude was that dude was looking locked in, man. Like this, I say this to people all the time. This this group of guys are not the elite, top tier NBA players in the world. But this is a very well constructed team, very well constructed team. A lot of guys who who can who are stars that can play a role. It seems like that's what they identify as. They wanted guys that are stars that can play a role. And I think they did a very good job of it. Jaron Jackson Jr. It's been incredible showing you why he was defensive player of the year. You could feel the game shift when he came in and out defensively, the things he was doing. Some crazy block shots Jaron was getting. Uh, Jaron knocked down a three. His jump shot looked a little little bit different. I don't know if you noticed that. It did. His jump shot looked sweet. Uh, he didn't shoot as many. I guess he, you know, that's not really his role on the team. Um, Jalen Brunson has been crazy. Mikael Bridges looked very good. Uh, Anthony Edwards kind of forced a little bit, but he was good. Cam Johnson, man, good man. God. I didn't know Cam Johnson was that good. He, that dude is a really good player, man. Austin Reeves, uh, good to good to have on on the side. You can actually cheer for the bullshit he does on the court. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing for sure. Uh, but, yeah, I'm excited about it. Santi looked good. Man. I guess Team USA as well. You know what I thought to myself as mm -hmm. I was watching that? Damn, the yeah, NBA is in you. good hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dude, uh -huh. like this is like – this is – these guys are all extremely talented guys, but they're young. Mm -hmm. They're the next wave of superstar in the NBA. And I'm thinking when, because whenever mm -hmm. you have a kind of a, a generation of superstar leave, right? when LeBron decides to retire, when all these guys decide to go, there's a level of like, oh man, like who's going to be the next guy? Man, the NBA is in such good hands. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of dudes on that team that can play, man. Like I said, these aren't your top tier players, but you've got a lot of dudes just hooping on that team, man. And I I, I was kind of worried about the, the point guard situation because when Brunson comes out, you kind of got um, kind of get your boy uh, Halliburton playing or whatever. He's fine. I mean, you know, I mean, he's, he's fine. He's not really a true point guard, but he looks he looks really good out there in certain moments. Um, the wings are really good. They probably, if they, I would, Desmond Bain would have been incredible on this team. <laughs> Desmond Bain would have been incredible on this team, man. If they had one more shooter. Let me ask you this. Is the FIBA team. is the FIBA three point line? Is it the college distance or is wanna, it the NBA? I want to say it's somewhere in between. I don't So it's okay. Yeah, so it's, it's not NBA distance. Though. No, I don't think it's quite an NBA distance. Um now I'm gonna tell you, there's one guy who's not on this team that doesn't make sense. I don't understand why he's not on it. Why isn't Evan Mobley on this team? Ooh. Like because they've got uh, uh, not Porter, not Otto Porter. What's his name uh, from the Milwaukee Bucks? Uh, Portis. They got Bobby, oh, Bobby Portis. Portis. Yeah, Dude. out there who he's fine, but they need a him Mobley and Jaron. Oh man, my God. come on, man! I've been disgusting, and they're not playing Walker Kessler at all, man. That dude's like not playing on this team, so that all, that's all strange. Uh, but I love the way this team is constructed. I like I like how they're doing their thing for sure, man. So props to the USA. Um, I would love to see this team win. They've been screwed. They've been scrutinized. A lot of people have been talking shit about them. I would love to see um, Team USA get this win for sure and win this whole damn thing. Sadly. Any of these guys, any of these guys on the FIBA team, do you think could make the? Because obviously the World Cup mm -hmm. roster is going to look a little bit different yeah, than when yeah, the yeah. Olympics happen. Right. Any of these guys from the FIBA World Cup roster make it to the to the? Uh, yeah, I think I think Jaron's going to be there. Um, I think uh, you're probably going to see Jaron and AD as your big your centers. Um, so to speak, um, probably, um, why is my brain not working, man? Uh, Bam out of bio. You think Bam will play? Bam, uh, Bam, Jaron and AD are probably going to be your bigs, mm -hmm. your centers, whatever. Of course, those guys can kind of be interchangeable. Um, Donovan Mitchell, of course, Devin Booker, if you can get him to come out. You like Ant on that team? You like Ant moving uh, up or do you think he needs another couple of? I kind of I kind of thought Ant would be a guy that can kind of lean on further. We've got more to go. Like I don't know, you know, we got a whole we haven't started the, the actual tournament. tournament yeah. yeah, so who knows what Anthony Edwards is going to look like? He's been good, 
But I thought we'd see more of him looking like a monster. We haven't seen that yeah. at all. Um, Bridges, I think, is the guy who's going to make that team. Um, you think Brunson? Man, Brunson hooping. Man. Like, <laughs> uh, hey, I wouldn't be mad if they told Dame or Steph, hey, sit this one out. Because Brunson's been hooping for sure. But it's good stuff, man. I'm really I'm really excited about how they look uh, for sure. And Santi, there's Santi and Jaron. Jackson Jr. future front court thing looks like looks like it could be something. Like might not real. be the future much longer. Yeah, it might be, it might be the right now for sure. So uh, I was excited about that for sure. Uh, number two, uh, the basketball Hall of Fame um, was this weekend. The inductees, major inductees: Greg Popovich, Tony Parker, uh, Dwayne Wade, Dirk Nowitzki, Pau Gasol, and a uh, 1973 women's team. I don't really know who or what they were referring to. It was six years before I was born. Yeah, and I kind of have a I kind of have a thing where if it happened before. I saw it. I don't it doesn't anything. count. I don't have anything to say about it. Like I don't. I mean, not nothing good or bad. I don't. I don't. Right. Know. I don't even know what they were talking about. Um, real quick, Greg Popovich. He's my greatest coach of all time. I can't think of anybody that I'd say. I'm talking about as far as like the things he speaks up about off the court. Um, longevity, man. I hear people say, "Well, Count Rings, Phil Jackson." No, Phil Jackson is not the greatest coach of all time to me, man. Greg Popovich has had like a 30 year run. And I want to say he's had a winning record for, like, the vast majority of those seasons, man. And he, and he hadn't dodged anything. Like, he's he's been there the whole time, whether it's good, bad. He's transitioned through several phases of the NBA. Whether you're talking, what you know, different styles of play. Iso ball, pick and roll ball, you know, uh, pace, uh, 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 playing in space. All these all these things, man. You know, quick. Every, every phase of the NBA you can think about, he's been there for. And he's excelled through all of it, man. Um so um, he's definitely my my goat coach uh, for sure. It high, definitely felt like the respect. it definitely felt like the San Antonio Spurs Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Like every, I mean, Pal Gasol, yeah. Tony Parker, Greg Popovich, mm-hmm. Becky Hammond, Tim Duncan was there. Tim Duncan was there. Manu, Manu, Manu was there. Yeah, that, that, he's this is their that era though, that era of players is starting to come all come out. So yeah, I didn't understand how he was able to go in and he's still active. I thought you had to be retired to get in, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I guess coaches may be different. Uh, Tony Parker, very underrated player, man. A guy that they were trying to get out of San Antonio for Jason Kidd at one time. Uh, kind of like a Ray John Rondo type guy as far as being that, that young kid, on a rookie on a team full of events. Right, bits, right. And still, you know, taking that team to the finals. Very underrated guy, Tony Parker. That floater was crazy. So many guys in the NBA have that, have that uh, Tony Parker floater in their game now that he really was one of the pioneers in. Uh, definitely deserved to be in. Dwayne Wade. Uh, of course, God it was awesome. One of the greatest shooting guards of all time. Um, I, I, I always say, man, you're a good player when when every every season there's somebody there. A lot of guys they're comping to your game. Every year, every dude that's six four, athletic, needs to work on the jump shot a little bit. Yep, can play a little bit on the ball. Dwayne Wade comp, <laughs> and it was like that. It's been like that for the last seems like twenty years, man. But Dwayne Wade, like one of the greatest shooting guards of all time, for sure. Uh, if you want to say he's number two, you want to say he's number three, I don't really care. But he's up there. He's one of the greatest shooting guards of all time. One of the greatest players of all time, Dwayne Wade, man. A very influential player in the league. Did you get to watch any of the speeches? Not really. Um, man, Dwayne's speech was awesome. I got to see it. I know that uh, Allen Iverson introduced him, and he had AI, He had D Wade's jersey. Yep. Uh, his jersey, the number, in, uh, same style number, probably came off a jersey that did, was sold into his suit. Did you know that Dwayne Wade wore three because of yeah, AI? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until the until speech. Now, yep. Yeah, that's crazy. And speaking of influence, man, I'm going to, this guy is probably the most underrated influential player of all time. You're talking about a guy who the modern NBA, he's a big reason why it's the way it is. And we talked about this before, being a guy that they wasted so many years of his career trying to make him something he's not instead of just letting him be awesome. That's Dirk Nowitzki, man. <laughs> like, you're talking about a guy, seven foot, knocked down any short on, shot on the court. Um, that almost, almost cursed. But I cursed anyway, but yeah, I would not then. But anyway, Dirk, <laughs> one of the most influential players of all time, man. The modern NBA where bigs are taking threes and getting to the basket and shooting for mid-range. No matter who you're talking about, Dirk Nowitzki's game so influential in today's yes. NBA. Man. Dirk Nowitzki was the first NBA superstar that I remember watching in his prime and going, he's unguardable. Yeah, for real. He's a robot. He let you know he was unguardable too. He was a he was a taller Larry Bird, which is yeah. scary. 
And he was re- he didn't have the defense of Larry, but Dirk Nowitzki was an incredible player. Man, a lot of people slept on him. He told people, if "You give me a chance, I'm going to be good." And he 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 called his shot, and he and he made it, man, for sure. Uh, last guy I'll talk about, Pau Gasol, the original star in yep. the city of Memphis as far as NBA is concerned. Pau Gasol came here very young, player, 19 years old, out of Spain. Um, I think he he think he played here six seven years. Our first All Star, um, great player, man. It's it's debatable whether or not. Um, his number should be retired when he mm. I mean should be retired as a Memphis Grizzly. I used to kind of be like, nah, who I don't want that to happen, but I don't mind it. I mean, whatever, man. You're talking about a guy, the first player who played here with longevity yeah. to make it to the NBA Hall of Fame, uh, one of the best skilled big men of all time, Pal Gasol. So shout out to Pal for sure, man. Had a lot of fun times uh playing with Pal on the video games. <laughs> you know what I <laughs> mean? And uh just having a guy that you that you rooted for, that 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 you put out in front to represent your team. All the negative things people said about him, regardless of all that, Pau Gasol, one of the greatest big men uh, to ever play the game. A very underrated player again. Glad, glad to see him represent in the Hall of Fame. Uh, number three, James Harden. Just out there just saying shit. Just, <laughs> just out there saying shit, man. Uh, a lot of words that don't really amount to nothing. This, this is kind of... I'm a, I'm a power to the players, dude. I say that all the time on here, man, but... Between this and the Damian Lillard situation, man, I don't have time for this, man. You guys have huge <laughs> contracts that are kind of making it hard for teams to move y'all ass anyway. In uh, James Harden defense, I will say um, that Daryl Morey uh, pretty much, you know, Harden took a pay cut, you know, a year ago to, to, to free up money for other guys. And his he's basically, he's been saying that he would be, thought he'd be taken care of on the back end. That didn't happen. Uh, he's out here. He didn't get. He did not get a max deal from uh, from Philadelphia. And he's he signed, you know, that one year deal to make himself a free agent next year. I don't think there's anybody who's gonna throw money at James Harden or would have thrown money at him anyway. Daryl Morey was the only guy that could have paid him. Daryl Morey knew that when when they made whatever agreement they made last year. Uh, I think it's a bullshit deal. He should not have agreed to that. He should have got his money last year when yeah. he could have. Um, but yeah, it's, but we don't know what his market was yeah, even last yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. But it's just ugly and nasty, man. Because you got guys who, you know, you can't you can't just not play, man. But it looks like between him and Dame, I don't know if either one of these situations is gonna be resolved by the time the season starts. And it's just it's just nasty work, man. And it's just I don't have time for this, man. I just I just want to see guys play ball. <laughs> I don't all this dumb stuff and like it's just a bunch of talking, man. You're you're saying that in China, you know what I mean? It's, it's all done. Have you ever heard a player say something like that publicly? No, no. That was that to me was the wildest part because yeah. usually all that stuff's handled behind the scenes, yeah. right? And like, then Daryl Moore is like, "Well, I hear you, but still ain't trading your ass." I love his phrase. Yeah. I love. I, I think the <laughs> phrase that he gave was his response was, "I am unmoved." Yeah, I was like, "Oh, yeah, it's gonna be some ugly shit, man, uh, going forward." And, and Harden, Harden's one of those dudes, man. And you said, has anybody ever said that? If I was to take a guess, if I was, you'd ask me two weeks ago who would say something like that, I would say James Harden. Here's why. I think there are some guys who play for the love of the game, and there are some guys who play for the love of money. I think James Harden is somewhere in the middle. I think he loves the game. I think he wants to win. I think he hates the, the fact that he hasn't won. I think he hates the pressure that's put upon him to win at the highest level, uh, win the championship, things like that. But I think that and I think that James Harden also loves being a celebrity. He loves being rich and famous and the mm. lifestyle that comes with it. I think he likes to party. He likes the women. He likes the strip clubs. He likes the rental women. He likes the all those things. You know what I mean? Um and I think that he understands that the NBA is a business and, and it's a way to him to live his lifestyle that he wants to live. And I think that he, you know, kind of treads that line <laughs> between the two, man. And um like I said, it le- it looks a lot more like he just likes the lifestyle sometimes, but you're talking about a guy who who flat out can play still. You know, he's he hadn't won any championships, and he freezes in a lot of those big moments, but James Harden is still a great player. So um, I kind of pull for him in certain aspects, but I don't have time for none of this at all. Kenny, just be real with you. I have time for none of this. We got our own problems, man. We got our own superstar who's trying to get his stuff figured out. So, yeah, I don't have, I don't have time for James Harden right now at all. We're about to take a break, man. We're going to come back with uh, Inside the Same Brain. Man, this might be the best TV show of all time. We'll talk about that when we come back on the Anthony Sane Show. See you guys in a minute.
it's hard to poke a hole in this roster. I mean, it's weird saying that in August, but just looking at the spread of it, the way it's the way it's worked out and come together, and what the staff has done. Once again, flowers are deserved. Isn't it, it, like if you're poking a hole, it's all kind of more abstract thoughts. Absolutely. Like how are they going to gel? Yep. If you're just talking roles, they have every role filled. Yep, we won't know that for months. Yeah. So instead of harping on that like you know some people are going to get fired up about that now like just looking at what's built and where this could potentially go is pretty cool tune into on the bluff with christian fowler and gabe coon every tuesday at 12 p.m on the bluff city media youtube channel will memphis play a team of that caliber in the regular season this year wow i asked a similar question i'm gonna say no because I don't know. With, are we talking like four legitimate NBA guys? That's what I'm saying. Like they have absolute NBA players. Like what team are you going to play that has? I mean, that I think there's probably, there's probably a, a potential in the Bahamas, Atlantis battle for Atlantis. I mean, on you're talking one team on one team. I mean, I think it depends on who you get matched up. That is so rare. From four. A I know TJ. From a professional standpoint, probably not. Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. Welcome back, everyone, to the final segment of the Anthony Sane Show. We call this Inside the Same Brain. Well, I'll talk about something that's been on my mind. Think I got stuff I got going on outside of sports. Whatever it may be, this is what we do here on the Anthony Sane Show for Inside the Same Brain. Kenny Stubberfield, all right, have you seen the show Winning Time? It's in season two. It's on what used to be HBO Max, and now it's simply called Max. Have you seen it? I have not seen this season of, of the Winning Time, no. So you, so you saw the first season? Yeah, I think so. Come on, bro. How do you know? I can't you? remember. I watch a lot of... <laughs> listen, bro. I watch a lot of stuff. Get I think I I've you. seen it, but... I hear you. So you say you say if you did see, you just saw a couple episodes. I don't think I watched the entire season, but I think I watched a few episodes. All right, Ken, it doesn't make any sense. It sounds more like you've never seen it, but you want to. You don't want to sound like you haven't seen it. Well, <laughs> listen, that, that may very well be true. All right, we're going to say you ain't never seen it. I ain't it. never seen it. How All about right, that? You ain't never seen it. All right, because if you saw it, you'd be like, yeah, I've seen it. It's great or whatever. All right, so I'm going to talk to you as if you've never seen it because you haven't. You just on here cap. So <laughs> Winning Time is a show that's a um, drama. It's kind of kind of comedic. He's got some comedic elements to it. But it's basically about um, the Showtime Lakers run from the very beginning of drafting Magic Johnson on through. For some weird reason, I don't know that they were legally bound to this, but I know because of their HBO, they didn't call the show Showtime, which is also goofy because I was like, okay, man, no one cares. Just call it Showtime. Um, but I'll say this about the show. I didn't think it was going to be good at first. John C. Riley plays Jerry Buss, and I didn't think that was going to work. My God, it works. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Jason Clark plays Jerry West. He's phenomenal is, is that part. Uh, Adrian Brody plays Pat Riley. Didn't think that was going to work. Incredible. But the best part of the show, I think the casting is the best part of the show. They nailed everybody. Only person they didn't nail was the guy who plays Dr. J., the guy who played Dr. J last year was terrible. The dude was like 60 years old in real life. He looked <laughs> horrible. He was like 5'8 playing Dr. J. It was <laughs> trash. But the star of the show is uh, Quincy Isaiah, a guy that I ain't seen in nothing else. <laughs> and he plays uh, Magic Johnson. This dude is Magic Johnson. Oh, he makes me think that Magic Johnson was the coolest dude to ever pick up a basketball. Um, the guy that plays Larry Bird looks just like Larry Bird. And... And it talks about a lot of things that you kind of – the guy who plays uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is great as well. Um, and um, Norm Nixon, his son plays Norm Nixon in the movie, I mean in the show. But it, it kind of shows you the the <clears throat> bird versus magic dynamic is, is always through the thing, how, how they, how they kind of drove each other. And it talks about how – how much race played a part in it, how there were racial wars birthed from the Magic Johnson, Larry Bird situation. Uh, it's an incredible show. 
I advise you to stop flogging Kenny and watch the show because I will. I will absolutely. Watch and I'm it. not a Lakers fan, man. And, but this is a really good show. And something else it shows um, is the Lakers are a pretty broke ass organization, and they've kind of been flogging their way through this for a long time, man. And uh, to, this, to this day, they've kind of flogged their way by. They've kind of faked it to make it uh, so far. Um, but it's an incredible show, man. I'm tuned in. I don't miss at all. I watch it every Sunday evening. I think it comes out on Sunday. I watch it every Sunday evening. Season two has been phenomenal. Absolutely love this show. I hate the Lakers with everything in me, but this show is great, man. It's a lot of fabricated, but they let you know, unlike uh, Blindside. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of this is bullshit because they painted uh, Jerry West to be a freaking madman. Like, <laughs> they got Jerry West looking borderline crazy. And they painted out uh, Jerry Buffs to be just a super horny, uh, coochie over everything <laughs> type dude. <laughs> it might have been who he was, is that man. Not true? I mean, do we know that's not the case? Yeah, they painted Magic, uh, Magic Johnson to just be another uh, super hornball. Um, and they tell stories that, that may or may not that seem to be true. But they kind of show it in a very dramatic, over-the-top way. Um, I didn't know that Magic Johnson had a child <clears throat> before he got married. And that, that whole dynamic, too. Like, if, if him and his wife being childhood, childhood sweethearts, they painted like Magic Johnson was the biggest dog in the world. And he's, like, finally sat, settled down with her after being with the shit, you know what I mean, for years. But uh, it's really good, man. And, and I know it's gotten a lot of flack from the people who made, who the actual real people don't like how they're being portrayed in this. And I probably wouldn't either, especially if, if, if any or most of this stuff is true. So, yeah. But, Kenny, go check it out. You at home, go check out Winning Time. It gets to Anthony saying seal of approval for sure. Good shit. Good shit for sure. But that's another episode of the Anthony Sane Show. We thank you guys for coming out. Props to my boy Clayton Carrier, man. Take care of yourself out there in Omaha, man. We, uh, we, we, we appreciate you coming on, man. We're pulling for you. Thank you, man, for just coming in and just being a great citizen of the city of Memphis. Understanding Memphis, man. Understanding that you got to be real. And we're going to keep it real with you in return. That's my man, Clayton Collier. But y'all, for uh, Kenny Stubblefield behind the glass, this is your host, Anthony Sane. We'll see y'all guys next time on the Anthony Sane Show. And we up out of here. Thank you for listening to the Anthony Sane Show. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a rating and a review wherever you download your podcasts. Also, like and subscribe to Bluff City Media's YouTube page. For comprehensive coverage of Memphis sports, head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co and find out how you can become an insider. We will see you back here next week.